All right, everyone, I'm here with Madur Behel. Uh, Madur is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Virginia. Madur, welcome to the Twimla AI podcast. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, Sam. I'm very happy to be here and uh, excited to share a thing or two about autonomous racing today. Yeah. We are going to have a really interesting conversation. Uh, as you mentioned, we're talking about autonomous racing, but before we dig in or race off into that direction, I'd love to hear you share a little bit about your background and tell us how you came to work in uh, autonomous vehicles and autonomous racing. Sure. So, so I think for for me, the trajectory into AI and autonomous racing, uh, it really started uh, because of my love and affinity for robotics and autonomous systems. So as far as uh, I can remember, I've always been interested in robotics. And that, that interest really took shape in my um, undergraduate back in India, where I even got the chance to sort of lead the, the robotics club of my university. Uh, I must say, though, back then, you know, I was miles away from doing anything principled and scientific uh, and uh, what would be considered AI. It was mostly about hacking your way through, just getting this set of motor and arms to work and climb a staircase or navigate some uh, obstacle avoidance course. Uh, so I have no shame in admitting early on that uh, I think I probably have built five or half a dozen robots without ever having uh, written a single piece of a mathematical equation or even drawing a matrix. Uh, so, so really, I think the uh, the journey for me uh, solidified when I started attending grad school uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, and and that's really where I started, you know, learning about the theoretical underpinnings of the field and developing the background in. Uh, in control systems and embedded systems and optimization and eventually in machine learning uh, and autonomous systems and deep learning, uh, which we all know are somewhat like the ingredients of this uh, uh, you know, AI field. Yeah. And so uh, for me, I think that the, the tipping point or what I realized was that I had an affinity to apply uh, novel theoretical methods, but to physical systems, right? So that, that aspect of having to control something in the real world whether that's a robot or it could be even a building automation system, but something physical, something even safety critical or life critical, uh, that's some, something which is canonical to most of my research even today. And so when I joined the uh, University of Virginia a little over three and a half years ago, uh, you know, I got very uh, excited and interested in um, safety aspects of AI for robotics, for autonomous systems. And self-driving cars are a very good example for uh, this sort of a problem, and some mm -hmm. even consider uh, self-driving cars to be uh, one of the biggest challenges in the field right now, and and one which has the potential to transform mobility. So it, it got my attention, and I was very fortunate to work with some uh, super sharp students and very uh, uh, you know great colleagues, and have the freedom to pursue some crazy ideas, including one that I would love to talk about today, uh, where we are trying to train uh, artificial intelligence to race. Uh, self-driving cars at speeds of uh, over 150 miles per hour. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And we will talk about that. Uh, sure. I, I'd like to start by understanding your perspective on autonomous vehicles racing relative to kind of the more uh, typical autonomous vehicle challenges, right? In in you know city driving. On the one hand, you've got to worry about, you know, pedestrians and, you know, untrained drivers and yep. uh, balls rolling in the street, all these kinds of challenges that, um, you know, we're struggling to, to figure out how to deal with safely, safely, you know, not to mention your path planning in an urban environment and that kind of thing. Um, and a track environment, your, you know, navigation you know, is, is constrained quite a bit. That may be simpler. You know, you may tell sure. us that it's not. Um, you don't have balls typically rolling in the street. You don't have pedestrians trying to run across the track. You know, that, how do you think about racing versus, uh, you know, commercial or passenger autonomous vehicles that we're trying to develop in terms of, you know, relative challenge and complexity? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very great, a uh, great question and it touches upon a very key issue that you already identified that racing as a as an environment is very different from you know regular driving or urban driving so 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 let me maybe you know touch upon where i see the connections and the differences between the two so 
So in a nutshell, you know, if you look at what is happening in the autonomous vehicle industry today in terms of uh, making a case for whether or not their prototype car is safe, uh, I, I really see like two two ends of a spectrum, which have to be somewhat navig uh, we have to navigate those in order to uh, get to like a substantial uh, point where we, it can be considered safe enough to be running in the wild. So on, on one hand, I would say the approach is what we can describe as brute force. So let's drive millions of miles, whether in simulation or in the real world, using hundreds of thousands of vehicles in the fleet. Uh, and really, you know, uh, start looking at where did the vehicle make a mistake? When did the safety operator had to intervene? When did somebody disengage the autonomous mode and things like that? Yeah. So it's like a you know bucket list of oh here's something I have to get back to my engineers and design bring back to the table. Uh, and so it, um, I don't want to undermine the value of real world testing. I think it's irreplaceable. But at the same time, um, this this sort of a exhaustive approach. Uh, some might argue is, uh, you know, the, the list of things that you have to account for are uh, you know, uncountable or infinite in some sense, the list of mm -hmm. possible things that can go wrong. And these you're, include... You're checking off a list of corner cases. You've got a long list that you need to check off. Yeah, and I, I would say that it's maybe even impossible to check it off completely. So you, you get into this whole argument about what sort of a statistical guarantee could you offer at the end of the day. I think that's a, that's a separate discussion to be had. Mm -hmm. um, so you're right, you know, and, and the part of the problem is this heterogeneity in the uh, number of objects that have to appear in the scene. And even if you have perfect detection of uh, these different agents, different vehicles or lane markings, traffic signs, traffic lights, pedestrians, pets, yeah. you know, a very long list. Um, even if you had 100% accurate uh, scene understanding, it's very difficult to anticipate what everybody else is doing, uh, which you need to do in order to plan your own sort of maneuver in the in the short term and like you know the next second or two seconds. Mm -hmm. So this is where I think most of the focus of demonstrations and uh, and very impressive in many cases without a driver behind the wheels uh, is being done today. On the other end of the spectrum is uh, more theoretical. We need some breakthrough, I would say, in um, bridging AI and deep learning with giving guarantees or formal methods, which is like a sub-discipline in computer science, right? So, so can we design algorithms which we can, uh, you know, look at what bad inputs will cause what bad outputs? And, and, and in a nutshell, they have to be accountable for why they are making a mistake, which is, you know, we are very far from that. There's some uh, you know, very exciting work in that area as well, but we are not quite there yet, you know, so that breakthrough has to occur. Mm -hmm. So, so this is a wide spectrum. There's many other approaches. I'm a little bit simplifying it. Um, and so I see there's many intermediate uh, steps where you could still make progress and enhance safety of self-driving cars. And so one idea or rather hypothesis that we are working on is what I would call uh, safety through agility. With the idea being that if we can teach an autonomous vehicle how to operate at the limits of its control, how to steer aggressively, how to brake aggressively, how to maneuver in an agile manner, then I would argue you are ultimately enhancing the safety of that autonomous vehicle, right? So, 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 so I, I'll be the first one to say that, uh, uh, you know, driving safely and driving in an agile manner seem to be very contradictory uh, sort of objectives. And so uh, we are not proposing that you weave through traffic all the time. <laughs> But but instead, there are some theoretical results that say those folks that drive a little fast and weave through traffic help the traffic. Yeah, yeah, you know, you you are you're right there. I can't argue. With, I can't argue with that. Um, but yeah, so the, the idea is, um, we have all experienced this when we drive ourselves that there are irrational drivers. There's a mix of sort of human and semi-autonomous, eventually autonomous cars, and so we've seen you know occasionally that driver who indicates they will take the right exit, but then they merge left in front of you at the last second, or yeah, or someone yeah. will just brake check you for no reason, or speed up and overtake in an unsafe manner. So, so, so there's all these dynamic situations that the self-driving car has to deal with, and I would even go as far as saying that any collision or any imminent collision at the in the very last few milliseconds or even a second looks a lot like uh, you know racing because you are at a high speed and it's like a very abrupt change in momentum and so so the idea is that can we use racing as a means 
to learn this agile controller, right? So this uh, this controller that will augment the safe operation, but kick in when there's an imminent collision. So, mm -hmm. so I jokingly say this, but I think it's becoming true and true. Uh, everybody's teaching their vehicles to remain on the road. I'm teaching them with the ability to go off road if it matters most, if it ends up, you know, saving someone's life at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's the connect between being safe and being agile. And so uh, the next question obviously is that, how do you train an autonomous vehicle to be agile? And so that's where we draw inspiration from motorsport racing. And we simply say that let's race these cars against each other in these high speed, close proximity situations, which are the norm rather than the exception when it comes to being on the track, right? So most of racing is drivers trying to crash each other, but not quite, and even like impeding the progress of each other. So if we can capture those spatio-temporal interactions and you know, manifest them into a, uh, into a robust algorithm, uh, then we have a chance of uh, bringing it back to urban driving and enhancing overall safety. So, so in a nutshell, you know, <laughs> in, in motorsport racing, there's a saying that uh, if everything seems under control, then you're not going fast enough, right? That's mm -hmm. the that's the mentality of the race driver. And so what I'm trying to do is develop an AI with, with that statement as its uh, objective function. Nice. Uh, so to kind of understand the the landscape and the approaches in uh, autonomous racing on the, um, you know, urban driving kind of contemporary autonomous vehicles, one of the dimensions in which there are strong opinions is kind of the, um, you know, vision first or vision only approach. Right. Uh, you know, versus kind of sensor fusion. Um, that that's kind of correlated in some ways to end to end deep learn versus ensemble mm -hmm. systems. Is uh, and I'm curious if the the racing setting um, has specific implications in those dimensions, or you know, or, or um, you know, is it just as diverse the the directions that folks are going? Yeah. So the the short answer is there is a lot of room for many approaches, but but I'll I'll get into a little bit in the weeds of um, you know answering that more specifically. Uh, so, so so geek out with me for a second here, Sam. So Please. you know, and even it goes back to even what you said earlier. So uh, yes, racing doesn't look visually anything like urban driving. We don't have to solve this problem of detecting a million things on the track, right? There's only a few things. Uh, you would be actually surprised if there's anything besides another car on the track. We don't want that at all. Mm -hmm. so, so, so yes, you know, the equivalency is broken there. I think the biggest sort of, uh, uh, if I have to sort of outline it in terms of uh, approaches or, or, or technical issues. Um, so every robot or every self-driving car has to solve these three problems of perception, planning, and control. Right? That's the common DNA for all of robotics. And so, so in perception, we have a different set of problems in racing, but they are going to affect regular driving. Let me list some of the challenges itself. And then we can discuss whether vision only or fusion is a better way to go about it. So no one, or there is literally very limited or non-existing data how does LIDAR and camera and radar perform at speeds excess of 150 miles per hour, right? So there's vibration, images are going to get blurred. Uh, is there mm -hmm. skew in the radar because you are moving at hundreds of feet per second? So by the time you receive some packet, things have already moved around in your vicinity. Uh, and so, you know, what is the yeah. time? Specific to vehicles, I would have imagined that, you know, we'd be drawing on military uses of or, um, you know, aeronautical uses of radar and LIDAR, and there would be lots of information about how they perform at speed. Yeah, but but you'd be surprised, like the, the sort of uh, sensors that we are working on with the full scale car, which are the same sensors. So let me maybe re rephrase my statement. Yeah. The same family of sensors, which are on urban cars, haven't been tested yet on That's these. Right? So you are, you are right. There's definitely, definitely something that I don't know of, uh, or as classified sensor which has been tested. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I I thought you were referring to lidar and radar as a broad class of no, 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 as sorry. opposed to the specific you know working yeah. with a specific sensor. Yeah. The specific and that's a great point because yeah. you know if you're if we're talking about 
a machine learning, deep learning solution, they're going to be quite sensitive to the actual sensors that you're using. Yeah, you got it, right? So so the, the specific sensors themselves, uh, we have to work with a lot of issues. Like even something that you may not think about uh, for a regular car, there's a very important aspect that all your sensor data has to be perfectly synchronized to the same clock. And in regular driving, you can bear some offset between the LiDAR and the camera images, right? So the LiDAR is telling you there's an obstacle at this uh, bearing at this distance, but the camera is telling you that the pixel and the obstacle is offset. You can get by, you can do some machine learning to fix that, learn the skew over time. In racing, there's the, the margins become very, very thin, right? So it, the, the burden then is shifted to the software because you can only do so much hardware synchronization uh, on the real sensor. So these are just few examples in the in the perception stack, right? So let's move to to planning, and then we can go back to the fusion question. So in in racing, I would say planning is somewhat harder than regular driving because there is no structure to the traffic, right? So. Uh, racing has some general etiquette that drivers respect each other. They don't want to crash their own car, but it's not as spelled out as the rules of the road, which are you know embedded deep into uh, all the motion planning algorithms uh, of regular self-driving vehicles today. So, so there's no concept of yield, or <laughs> you know you don't want to yield basically, but at the same time you don't want to go into unnecessary risks. So, so there uh, one of the challenges that we have to solve is. We have to build state estimation algorithms that will uh, give a best guess or the likelihood of what the racing driver in front of us and behind us is going to do. And that's another thing about racing. You also have to worry about what's behind you and not just uh, everything yeah. is not just forward looking because you have to sometimes maneuver to gain a uh, like positional advantage. And so here there's a lot of room for, for novel algorithms where you, know, you are uh, you are planning in a in a manner that uh, you want to trade off uh, risk versus your track position, but at the same time, you know you you really don't want to thread the needle between two cars if it's not uh, absolute necess necessary to do so. So 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 we made some you know uh, some algorithms which are a mix of I would say this end to end idea uh, and you know a classical approach of plot path planning. So, mm -hmm. so I'll give you one example that in uh, in one of my work uh, with my PhD student, uh, Trent Weiss. Uh, so he has developed uh, this simulator. Essentially he has taken the world's most famous Formula One game. Um, and this game is so photorealistic that it's used by real F1 drivers during the pandemic because they couldn't race in the real <laughs> world. Uh, and so it's very photorealistic. It's uh, you know building upon decades of high fidelity physics and uh, ray tracing graphics and whatnot. Uh, and this game is so realistic that it actually outputs a stream of data to interface with these uh, massive hardware simulators that these drivers train in. Okay. So we leverage that, we leverage that and we tap or listen into that data stream and then we can convert the game into a simulation environment, right? So all of a sudden we have uh, methods to uh, look at the images of the camera from the game, from the driver's perspective and annotate that with some ground truth data about steering or speed and heading and things like that. So, mm -hmm. so this becomes a recipe to try some end-to-end -end methods. And we did try them and we found that if you just do a complete pixels to control end-to-end -end, uh, implementation where you are basing your steering and throttle based off the scene information or pixel information, or even a history of pixel information or images, it's very brittle, right? So it's simply just too brittle. The car cannot recover. Uh, if you go off track, you basically uh, ram into the wall uh, for sure. And so, so we had to fix that by breaking this chain of not being purely end-to-end. -end. And so what we do is we take the images and instead of mapping them to control values, we map them to trajectories, right? So we map them to, this is the path you want to follow for the next, you know, 100 milliseconds or one second or whatever horizon. And, and so- Ethical control. And then, yeah, then you use some low level control like pure pursuit or model predictive control to actually figure out the steering and the throttle actuation to follow that path. And what we have determined uh, very uh, surprisingly and interestingly is this is so robust, right? So this is already, uh, as competitive as some of the best uh, human expert drivers in the game, and oh, wow. uh, you know it's it's it has a very good understanding of uh, 
uh, where the track bounds are. And I must say that initially we went in purely with this supervised learning uh, method. So it's like behavioral cloning. We have tons of data of uh, drivers driving in the game. But now we have the ability to uh, not do just purely supervised learning, but instead uh, at runtime, we can actually generate many, many likely trajectories and then synthesize the preferred trajectory, which has some desirable properties. So, you know, you don't want to turn the wheel so sharply, or uh, you don't want to you want to minimize some derivative of the trajectory as well. So, 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 so interestingly enough, the way we design these trajectories is something, uh, we're using something called Bezier curves, which have their origin in computer graphics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to throw in this uh, trivia or snippet here that uh, Pierre Bezier, who was the pioneer of the Bezier curve, he intent he used these curves or when they were in invented or used or popularized, he used them to design the profile of Renault race cars, right? So in it's a very serendipitous way we are bringing the racing uh, roots of Bezier curves back into autonomous racing. Oh, and wow. so, so the last thing I would say here is- well, um, If I can, if you can uh, yeah, uh, sure. put a pin in that for one sec and, and remember it, um, you mentioned, you mentioned a bunch of things I wanted to drill in on, but one of the things that you talked about was you had this um, this kind of path that your low-level system is recommending or a family of paths, and then you have a set of constraints or desired properties. And I'm curious what those, you know, how those are implemented. Are those heuristics? Are those also learned? Um, where does that, how do you inform your model of those preferences? Yeah, so so they they aren't learned, although that is a possibility to use some kind of uh, inverse reinforcement learning to to learn what objective function the drivers actually use to generate their own paths. But we aren't there quite yet. So so what we draw inspiration from is uh, the actual domain of uh, of racing, right? So so my students and I, we have racing rules. We have watched videos. We have watch interviews of every crash that has happened and how the drivers explain what went wrong in that crash. And so this, this filtering process, right? You generate a set of candidate possible trajectories you could take, and then you have uh, some way of assigning cost to each trajectory. So there could be a cost of, uh, you don't want to be uh, you know, a certain distance laterally from any opponent. And that's, you know, gives the trajectory a certain weight. Another one, like I said before, is you want your trajectory to be have some smoothness property so that, mm -hmm. you know, the car will spin out if you yank the, the steering wheel uh, because these are very sensitive uh, vehicle dynamics. Uh, and so, so this is the layer where we can uh, sprinkle in the objective functions for collision avoidance, for multi-agent racing, for, you know, taking the sticking as close as possible to the geometric race line. So we have, a, uh, you could call it a heuristic, but it is, these are heuristics which are derived from the domain of uh, regular motorsport racing. So they're informed by, you know, what drivers typically look to maximize when they race. Uh, so yeah, so there is room to to do some machine learning there as well, but we haven't gotten to that yet. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. And the, the third point that you were mentioning. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was talking about that initially, um, the way we train our algorithm to to map images to trajectories on, in the front of the car ego vehicle on the track, uh, it's it's it was using behavioral cloning, which means that we have tons of data observed from the game of uh, regular uh, you know online players. Now we can even you know log into a session uh, as an autonomous agent and uh, have our car race autonomously amongst other humans without nobody ever finding out that they're racing against a, a game AI, right? So, 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 so essentially we can get data and observe data of other players as well. Uh, and mind you, this is, this may seem like a, a good idea, but there's a lot of bad data, right? Every, like you have some amateur mm -hmm. players who are cutting corners and we don't want our algorithms to pick that behavior, right? We want it to, uh, have a clean lap between the bounds of the track and set the fastest uh, sort of lap time as well. So that's why if you just do behavioral cloning uh, as you would in some any other machine learning setting, so supervised learning, you just have image and here's the trajectory which was taken by the expert. So just try to you know do some least square error between your trajectory and the ground truth. Uh, so that will get you halfway there, but because you are averaging over uh, multiple levels of expert data, it won't 
reach or get, get you to the point where you become competitive uh, in this uh, in this setting. So that's why we had to augment and take a step back from behavioral cloning by saying that it's not prudent to just generate one trajectory and follow it blindly, right. but let's generate a candidate of many possible trajectories and then use these uh, sort of filtering methods that I described uh, earlier to, to choose between them. Yeah. And the thing that I was wondering was um, if the behavioral cloning was related to, or if you draw inspiration from imitation learning uh, as it plays out in like reinforcement learning scenarios. Yes, yes, I would say very much so. It's a, they are very alike. Yeah, and then we are, you know, the we are somewhat hitting the ceiling of the fact that this is not meant to be a simulator. <laughs> we are just it's a game that we have. Right. And by the way, anyone can you know buy the game for what thirty bucks and. The API is open source. You can run all our experiments, and I think I provided the the link to this as well. But the the uh, you know this this sim this doesn't behave like a simulator where we could uh, hook it up to some kind of a open AI gym or reinforcement learning framework and run millions of instances very very fast to do exploration exploitation. So mm -hmm. so we want to do that. I think we need much more low level access to the game and. Uh, we are in conversation with the actual manufacturer of the, the game itself for a, a much more formal collaboration than us just trying to infer things based upon what's uh, readily available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, of the, the three areas that we've talked about, I think perception um, is about what I expected. You kind of lose some complexity because you don't have to worry about things coming on the road, but everything's happening much faster control, you know, things are happening much faster. I expect that to be more complex. Yeah. Planning, I think, I, is the, the one that surprises me. I would have thought that planning was simplified in the race environment because, you know, you're going, the track is, is, is static and circular, um, at least in a simple example. Uh, and everyone's goals are the same. You don't have people kind of crossing through your your domain that are trying to do random things that you have no idea or can't even fathom or predict what they might be trying to accomplish. Uh, but it sounds like that's not the case in your experience. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's not as easy. I mean, there are, there's some truth to your sort of expectation, uh, but I think the, uh, the thing which I think surprised us was um, even this, even you would imagine it's easier to predict what your opponent is trying to do, but it turns out it's uh, uh, it's pretty complicated, right? Because because there is no, uh, they could be literally the the reachability of their likely positions in the future just explodes. Because because even a small maneuver can get picked up by some algorithm or a Kalman filter, and they will just extrapolate that to mm -hmm. well, they could be anywhere on the track. Well, if that's the case, <laughs> how do I make progress, right? So so I think getting that piece pitch perfect has been. Um, uh, has been more of a challenge than I originally anticipated, uh, and then the 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 speed at the end of the day is the bottom line, which makes all of this uh, super super difficult, right? So we don't have even the luxury of time to do something super complex uh, at runtime, right? Because you may want to say, okay, uh, when I get to this turn, I'm going to do you know take this race line, and if somebody's on my race line, I'm going to plan something else. Well. You know, by the time you figure out your result, you're already there at the at the turn, right? So because the the car is moving so fast, so uh, so getting that trade off of how do you dynamically adjust your horizon, uh, you do, and and then there, there is there is high level planning strategy which comes into play, right? So you have to think about the uh, effect of the vehicle dynamics on your planner. So these cars are highly specialized and they have very mm -hmm. different dynamics than uh, regular sedans or SUVs that we drive. And so therefore you have to understand uh, that the tires will behave differently after 10 laps. Uh, you have mm -hmm. to monitor tire temperature, tire pressure, wheel slip angles, because the car will just drift out if you try to uh, you know, again turn to, uh, it's very sensitive to the rate of your steering that you input into the car itself. Uh, you have to account for aerodynamic effects, right? So in the in the real race and also in the simulation race that we are doing as part of preparing to uh, uh, you know move to the real car, um, all cars are same, right? It's a battle of AI algorithms. It's not about who has the deepest pockets or the most expensive motor. So 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 if everything is the same, you have two competitive cars. How do you ever overtake your opponent? And so 
in racing, there is this uh, concept of slipstream or drafting. So when you get behind an opponent opportunistically, you will gain up on them because you are moving through less uh, sort of dirty air and less yeah. draft. And so, so who, where's the path planner which takes that into account, right? right. It's, not, it, it's, it's not there yet. So, so there is just, uh, the devil is in the details basically at the end of the day. And, and that's why uh, the motion planning algorithms which exist for regular driving, you can take inspiration from them, but because of the lack of structure, there's no lanes, there is no defined uh, rule set of what other opponents are really trying to do, and that's really what got, you know uh, causes the the problem. And if you speak to any real race driver, which I've had the the good fortune of doing so, they will tell you that they race with feel. Okay, they can feel when the car is sitting at the edge of its traction. They mm -hmm. can feel when the rear left is going to give out any time, and so they can back off. Mm -hmm. In the track that we will race on in Indianapolis. Uh, it's very unforgiving because there's a concrete barrier on the right-hand side throughout the oval. So there's literally, you know, no incentive to, to go right uh, unless you are doing it to, to save yourself from a crash. So, so, so there's just a pile of issues we have to work through and make sure our planner is robust and can account for a combination of many of these issues that we are aware of. Uh, so you, you, in talking about planning, you raise this issue of, a kind of hierarchical planning you've got, you know, when you initially described it, you, you kind of project in, you know, a few milliseconds and then sure. you're choosing a path based on that. But then there's this higher level planning that you might want to do. You referenced the slipstream issue. I don't know if the track that you'll be racing on or the ones that you model are oval tracks, but if you've got a more complex track, you want to kind of hit the corn, hit the curves at a certain point, you know, low on the curve. Like how do you incorporate that, uh, type of higher level planning in? Is that part of these heuristics that you include in the low level or is it a, a, a totally different process? So I think different teams are taking different approaches. Uh, in my case, we have actually taken a cue from uh, some data driven and you know some machine learning methods that can help us out there as well. So, so we have some data to uh, infer from how uh, racing experts uh, navigate high-level strategic decisions. So, uh, you know, there's there's even some very good evidence and footage of uh, a driver intentionally backing off at a corner because they know that on the straightaway they will get into the slipstream and be able to uh, attempt in a better, uh, you know, have a better shot at overtaking. So, so uh, at a high level, it boils down to. Um, if I think about it, it, boils down to two or three high level things that we have to always worry about. One is everybody, if they have done their homework, knows what is the geometric fastest way around the track, right? That's sort of open knowledge. It's easy to determine. And so that's the one where if it's an oval, it's not as complex, but it's the one where you want to carry the highest speed through every corner. So you kind of go out on entry, you touch the apex, and then you exit wide as well. And that will give you the uh, sort of the curve of the largest uh, radius. So it's the minimum steering input. So everybody knows that. Everybody wants to be on that, but that's the mm -hmm. problem, right? Because if someone else is on your race line, you have two options. So either you go into uh, some kind of adaptive cruise control mode where you just stay behind them until they make a mistake, and then you get your chance. Yeah. Or you intentionally decide to deviate from your race line and see if there's a wide enough gap and where you want to merge back on the race line in front of them, all the while being aware of if there's any other cars which may interfere in this entire maneuver. And so, so, so this multi-agent aspect of high-speed racing is also what's making it very difficult. And it's a combination of both the short-term path you want to plan and, you know, you don't want to be myopic. You don't want to go after every opportunity of overtaking as well. So that's where some strategy comes in. You want to be aware of what is your current track position. So are you behind the pack? Are you in the middle? How many laps are left? What is the rate at which you can close the gap to your leading car? So there's just all of this racing knowledge has been embodied into a code essentially by my team over the past year and a half. And uh, you know that's what's allowing us to 
to match this high level strategic controller with the low level planner. And then even lower than that is the controller itself, which is going to uh, make sure we can follow the plan that we, uh, we generate. So it's, it's a mix of, again, uh, I, I know I'm giving the same answer again, but that's really the case. It's a mix of uh, these domain specific uh, maneuvers or strategic decisions that we have been able to um, encode into some kind of a logical sort of construct. And we are trying to implement that uh, using classical methods or using deep learning based approaches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing comes to mind in thinking about this that I'm not sure I can come up with any examples of having seen. Uh, and that is you know, typically when we've got you know video uh, off of a, a vehicle and we're labeling it, we're labeling it for things in the video. Um, your description makes me think about, you know, is there is there some kind of model or process where it makes sense to label uh, video or some other set of fees for driver intent? Like, what is the driver trying to do here? And then train a model based on trying to learn and to learn driver intent and, you know, then feed that into control. Does that does that make any sense? It does. And you know what, like, just Prior to this 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 uh, uh, podcast earlier today, uh, I am working with uh, uh, a bunch of people who are helping us label some of the data from these videos, which are openly available. So, so you raise a good point about the intent, and uh, we can do a certain bit of that in the game because uh, in the Formula One game, we can determine the track position of whatever car is in our field of view, and a history of track position is an indicator of future trajectory of the vehicle. Right? So that's actually the, the ingredients to this uh, model, which is doing the state estimation for other agents, right? It is some kind of a recurrent neural network, which is looking at a history of intent of the driver and then trying to predict the most likely thing that driver is going to do within my uh, planning horizon. Um, having to capture intent just from like onboard camera footage is, is pretty difficult, I would say. I, mm -hmm. I haven't tried it, uh, but you would be surprised. Like even something that we may take for granted because, you know, like you would say, okay, uh, if we go back to perception, um, we don't even think about that detecting vehicles, how difficult of that is a problem for self driving because there's a pre-trained networks on these massive data sets that can classify uh, 3D bounding boxes and volumes of where vehicle is, where the drivable surface is. And we used some of these uh, data sets and these pre-trained networks and we told them, can you now tell us where the racing cars are on the track? And they were like, no better than a coin toss. So there's no, there's not even a specialized, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's not even a specialized data set for doing bounding box detection for racing vehicles. Because yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if you detect four wheels, it's likely a car, but the rear end of the vehicle, the side perspectives, they look very different from these regular vehicle detection. So, so I'm having to lead that effort myself, and we have a corpus of, you know, uh, uh, tens of thousands of images now where we are detecting the bounding boxes for these specialized IndyCar uh, looking vehicles. And so my feeling is once you can uh, get to where, let's say the centroid of that vehicle detection is, then you start looking at a history of image sequences and that will give you some, uh, some idea of the intent of the real driver as opposed to the gaming driver. So there might be something, something to it yet. We haven't done it with real data and we are relying on our, our state estimator, which is trained on the simulation and the game yet uh, to solve this problem of intent prediction there. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so we've talked about uh, the, the challenges relative to racing and you've got some specific examples of the, the way you put this stuff to the test. You've hinted at one, which is this uh, autonomous challenge, um, but you've got another one, and I, I think you've got an example of that in your background there. This uh, yep. F one ten. Tell us That's a little correct. bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is a. Uh, I know if someone is not looking at the video, there's a one ten scale vehicle behind me. It's a fully autonomous uh, one ten scale race car. So uh, yeah, this is uh, another one of uh, uh, my 
my brainchild and I really like developed this when I was graduating out of my uh, PhD degree uh, at Penn. Uh, and so uh, before I kind of describe what this is all about and the Indie Autonomous Challenge, which is the, the next big thing that we are currently navigating around, uh, let me prefix this by, by just saying, um, you know, we do all the research and the cool things in our, in our lab and we have access to all these resources. Uh, but I've always felt that the way, uh, you know, there's a big gap between the way we conduct research in self-driving and autonomous vehicles and the way we teach about these things uh, to undergraduates and graduate students alike. And so so uh, a lot of the, the initiative behind developing this uh, F110 or this 110 scale uh, racing platform was to make autonomy accessible for everyone, right? So I actually truly believe that this is the best time to be working in AI and autonomous vehicles. And then you know, these, these technologies are already sort of well knit into the fabric of society. So, so this, this vehicle is essentially um, was a scaled version of what you would find on a regular uh, self-driving prototype. So it has a LiDAR, it has cameras, it has an IMU sensor, it has the same family of uh, the GPU from NVIDIA that you would find on full-scale cars. It has a wireless channel, which you can remotely access for telemetry. And so, so we developed this and we made this open source. Anyone can go to f110th.org uh, and then you will find this almost Ikea-like instructions for how to put this together. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, you can put the hardware together. It's, uh, it's reasonably priced, but then there's the software part, right? So like, like I said before, this is all about uh, improving algorithms of perception planning control. So I actually teach uh, a course on uh, autonomous racing online, and uh, uh, you can also find that on YouTube. It's not behind any paywall. It's just free. Uh, all the video lectures will walk you through first understanding the software, which is based in ROS, or Robot Operating System, and then we gradually go all the way to you know path planning and perception and uh, SLAM and mapping, uh, and then eventually racing. Uh, and so there's a great, this is a great tool for doing research. It's a good tool for education. And for the past four years, I've also been organizing uh, the uh, international uh, F110 autonomous racing competitions at some, you know, premier venues in robotics and machine learning and cyber physical systems. So teams from all over the world, they build their cars and then they come and we compete in autonomous racing. In fact, long before we went to full scale autonomous racing, uh, we already successfully showed the world's first autonomous overtake on one tenth scale, right? So where they had to do a month, month, sort of like a, a practice run for the for the real deal. Um, yeah, so this is this is an excellent platform. It's very popular. It's used by uh, almost fifty institutions around the world. And now you know this this is this is, and I like to say it's one tenth the scale, but it's ten times the fun. It's it's my favorite course to teach <laughs> teach as well. Have you and, looked at the uh, the AWS Deep Racer platform? Yeah, I have. I have. I think the the I give them props for bringing the price point to below five hundred dollars. But uh -huh. uh, I think this vehicle, uh, not to kind of dismiss the AWS effort, but the F one ten vehicle is uh, a lot more heavy duty and capable. So, you know, just to give you an idea, this thing can go up to sixteen miles per hour indoors, right? So oh, it's wow. in, it's impossible to run behind it and keep track of it. Deep so, racer is not very fast. It's not fast. <laughs> yeah, I think, but they, so, so I think they did a good job of making sure that you have a like an online simulator available. So they made yeah. the onboarding process easy, uh, which is the bulk of the effort actually. Like, we had to invest a ton of time to make sure all the documentation, every single piece of what is needed to get started with this is taken care of, right? So you can literally like, get started if you have the hardware in less than two hours. And so in, in line of, you know, and so we can now test the ideas on 110 scale in my lab. We, I have about 20 of these cars in, in my lab. <laughs> so uh, we can do very complex maneuvers with multiple cars. Uh, but you know it has its limitations, right? So it's it's a different scale, different parameters. But the braking on this vehicle is not realistic, and there's no aero aero effects at all. So our, our next big endeavor uh, at UVA and my group is we are participating in this Indy Autonomous Challenge, uh, which is essentially uh, you know in my view the DARPA Grand Challenge for autonomous racing, right? So it's a million dollar race that will take place in October this year at the historic Indianapolis Motorsport Speedway, which is uh, considered as part of the top three tracks in racing. So it's part of the triple crown in racing is what they call it. 
And so we will be racing with some fellow innovators uh, from US and from outside of, uh, uh, of the country, uh, about seven or eight cars, I anticipate, in, in the world's first head-to-head -head fully autonomous race, uh, where we can you know, um, aim to go above 150 miles per hour. That's the goal. And everybody's kind of trying to you know, fully immerse themselves to uh, make that a reality. So, so you know, uh, just to just to quickly remark on uh, on the significance of this, uh, if you look at motorsport racing, or the history of motorsport racing, it has always been the proving grounds for automotive technology. In fact, the reason it started was because when people transitioned from horse-driven carriages to horseless carriages, they were very skeptical. And now we are transitioning from driver to driverless, and there's the same sort of skepticism here. Mm -hmm. So racing became as means to, to show endurance and safety and convince people that the engine is not going to blow up in your face and the brakes work properly and everything is you know trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So I think a similar litmus test is now required for the software stack for self-driving. And so I, I think racing can become um, that proving ground where we can push the AI for self-driving to its limits and show that, you know, if you can race at high speeds in close proximity when people are trying to intentionally block your progress without crashing, uh, that's a very significant token and it could eventually have a huge bearing on safety of regular autonomous driving. So I'm very excited uh, to be involved in this challenge from the very get-go and we can't wait to get our hands on uh, the actual race car and uh, transfer our knowledge from one ten scale from the simulation onto the actual vehicle. You've got a few months, but uh, <laughs> how close do you think you are in terms of being able to successfully complete that challenge? Yeah, I'm a I'm a rational optimist, Sam. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I think it's a it's a, you know. Yeah, I would be amiss to say that it's going to be easy. It's a very significant undertaking. Um, we all know as roboticists that when you work with the real thing, there's just a bunch of messy real world problems that you have to overcome before you even get to the, the intellectual sort of part of why your algorithm is better than others. Uh, so my feeling is we'll spend a solid few weeks at a stretch to just work through these uh, issues. And, and what it helps is because most of our competitors are from other academic institutions. There is some you know, collaboration happening at what is the base level software that everybody will have access to? So because there's a lowest common denominator that every team has to overcome mm -hmm. before it becomes about the high level algorithms. So it is a significant undertaking. We have uh, access to some predetermined schedule where we have reserved track time uh, in Indy. And so my team and I will travel to Indy, we'll spend the entire summer there, uh, possibly even the next semester. And then- uh, oh, wow. Come October, yeah, I mean, I'm literally uh, running a, uh, besides my research lab and my own research, I'm also running a racing team <laughs> on nights and weekends. So it's, but it's very exciting. Um, you know, I, I, I have no qualms about it. This is sort of what, uh, what really excites me. I think uh, uh, it, it's, going to, it's going to be a tough undertaking and, uh, you know, just like any sport, uh, if the outcome is a reflection of how much effort you put in, then I think that's a, uh, uh, that's my own thinking of it. So we'll go all in. We'll try to, um, you know, get this car running. Firstly, I don't think on the first day we'll uh, we'll touch even 25 miles per hour. But it's a mm -hmm. you, know, you slowly take your car uh, through the paces, and you gain more confidence about your localization is working fine. You are confident that what you see as the position of the car is where the car is on the track. So uh, we have a long flight checklist, uh, if you will, that we have to go through, and then. Um, then it becomes, you know, um, what did we miss when we were designing all these uh, cool ideas in the simulation? How did they plan out on the track? What are the obvious things that we missed about uh, the behavior of the car? Uh, and it's also, you know, we have more than just computer scientists on my team. We have people from mechanical engineering, from systems engineering, from ECE embedded systems. There's actually a racing driver on my team who has some background in NASCAR racing. So oh, wow. it's just it's a pretty elaborate gig that I have going on right now. And That's uh, awesome. Yeah. We, we, you know, we started this talking about uh, kind of what we can learn uh, about safety from racing. I'm curious how you, when you, you think about 
you know, putting this AI that you're building into a full scale car moving at 150 miles an hour, how do you think about the relationship between speed and safety and, um, you know, being competitive, but also being safe? How do you approach that? Yeah, so that's a tough one to to uh, really nail down. Um, you know, speed is only useful if you are facing the the right direction, right? So 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 <laughs> the, the 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 first thing is to I think we we prioritize safety over speed because the cost of being unsafe is the ultimate price where you lose your car and you can't compete. Uh, I know it's not so. You know, my my honest feeling is that while we strive to go to these uh, super high racing speeds, it's going to be quite difficult to um, you know, show that you are overtaking and going close to the barrier and taking that super risk, which is all the excitement about racing. Um, you know, I, I honestly think that's a very tough ask. So, so this is not the only such competition. It's not the last one uh, for sure. I think it's, it's, it's a process, right? So we are sort of at the, just like with any field, when you're at the frontier of a certain field, there are more sort of unanswered questions um, uh, than there are answers. I feel this one is, is is in that realm. So so we do prioritize collision avoidance actively, both in front of us and behind us. So even if the car behind us is doing something erratic, we would rather not deal with that than to be like, oh, let's push our elbows out and see what happens, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and, and part of it is this, just mindset of uh, the roots of our research is in safety of AI, safe autonomous vehicles. So it would be uh, kind of a moot point if we just take an unnecessary risk and uh, and crash our car, right? So uh, as they say, uh, uh, to finish first, first you have to finish, right? So that's, I think, a good summary of uh, how we approach uh, this trade-off between safety. At the same time, you know, we, we do want to push our car to the limits of um, how fast it can go while respecting and behaving in an uh, expected manner. So maybe uh, my response to this sort of trade-off is, uh, we are comfortable going at the speed limit where the car behaves as we expect it to behave. So as a racing team, we hate surprises, okay? So if, if things are deterministic, if we know how our car will behave in a given situation, sure, let's go for it. But as soon as we begin to get into that gray area where hey, we didn't anticipate that. Oh, why did we make that steering adjustment? So maybe, you know, our models are a miss. They were not designed for such speeds. Or we have obviously, you know, mistuned some parameters somewhere. So then we will apply the brakes uh, uh, literally and figuratively on our approach here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Madhu, thanks so much for taking the time to share with us uh, a bit about your journey and what you're up to. It's very cool stuff. Yeah, thanks, Sam, for, for again inviting me to this. Uh, I had a really fun time, very enjoyable discussion. And uh, keep an eye out. In October, you will likely hear about this event. And uh, uh, yeah, I hope to be amongst the teams which cross the finish line but not crashing. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sam.